Thank you very much, William. Uh, so this is the beginning of our celebration of the 50 years. We kind of started off last night toasting already. Uh, <clears throat> Ron, 50 years ago, did his first decision analysis. And uh, as the story goes, I mentioned it last night that he was teaching statistical decision theory. Now, I think he might tell us what the difference is between statistical decision theory and decision analysis, because that was actually a very big step, and I think that's why we have a profession, and uh, we'll hear more about those kinds of things. But uh, it was in response to somebody saying from a statistical decision theory course, well, couldn't we apply this to a real decision? And I think that difference between uh, theory and the practical application is the bridge in this long history of really a philosophy of thought that has withstood many, many challenges over hundreds of years. But that's the transition that Ron gave us that we've built on. And so I'm very delighted to be here to introduce Ron for this, to have been instrumental in bringing him here. And uh, my whole career is built on what he has done, and I think many of us in here. So I wanted to kind of check first and saying, Ron, to give you a chance to see how many of you have been direct students of Ron? Please stand up. Okay. So how many of you have found your decision analysis from someone that has either been SRI International or SDG, DFI, ADA, DDI, and so on, okay, that are all offsprings from Ron Howard? Please stand up. So now we have about ha more than half, Ron. And I would expect that if we trace on more carefully where people have gotten it internally, some of you may not know how the bridge goes back. But this is the majority of the practice. And I'm delighted to have Ron tell us a little bit about how we got this started and what it means to be 50 years, because I think the value we create in making better choices, it's the, the cheapest, best place to make a difference in the world. You know, it's just amazing to me how much value is wasted, and hopefully we can reduce that waste. So with that, Somik wanted to say some words from a perspective of a recent PhD graduate from Iran. Morning, everyone. So it will be an understatement for me to say that I've never met anyone like Professor Howard, and it's even difficult to talk about him. But I'm, I have a few snippets I wanted to demystify him a little bit. So in my six years of hanging out with him, I found that he does very, very small things with so much care that it really stands out for me. So I still remember when I first came into the management science department at Stanford, I didn't know anyone there, and I bumped into Ron. And he was, was in front of the elevator, and usually people, you know, we're all learning about what the professor's interests are. Ron was actually interested in what I, what I was doing and what my interests were. So I ended up telling him about agile software development, which was my interest at the time, and Ron did something very curious. So I don't know how many of you notice, he has a device hanging around his neck. So he picked it up and he said, Agile Software Development. And then the next time I met him, he already knew the key distinctions of this field because he you know, checked it online. So that's what he does every night. If you talk to him and he finds something he doesn't know, he'll speak into this device and then he'll learn and then he will ask you for more information. I haven't met anybody who learns so thoroughly, so continuously all his life. That really struck me. So another thing I remember is if you meet him in the hallway and you ask him, Professor, do you have some time? And he'll stop and he'll say, of course I have time. <laughs> the question is, what am I going to do with it? <laughs> 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 
So even the simplest of questions are, are, are an occasion for pause and for laughing and just realizing that we take life too seriously. So there are so many other stories. And another one is when you become a PhD student, you get this list of instructions. And that, just, that list is, you know, it's, it's the opposite of intimidating. It's just you read that and you start laughing. So the first one says that your, your dissertation, I expect your dissertation to be no more than 100 pages. Anything higher than that is highly regrettable. <laughs> And the second thing, which is very amazing, is he also tells his PhD students that I will not fund any of you. Just imagine that you're walking into the program and he says, sorry, no funding for you. You're going to have to work your way through the whole thing. So you, you'll pay for yourself by teaching. As a result, his PhD students take a lot longer. But by the end of it, we really understand what we are teaching because we've broken our head with you know, so many students we realized we actually didn't understand it the first time. And it's that process <laughs> that really drills it in. So these are very, very unusual things in academia. And I mean, those, of, uh, those of you who have PhDs will attest to this. Another thing is, it, it's really strange. He, he doesn't, I mean, the language that he has evolved in decision analysis is very distinctive. So I, I was reflecting on, on, on what is the value of decision analysis, what I've received from him. And I realized that you know, many of us hear things like, oh, it helps you make better decisions, sure. It helps you get more value, sure. All that is fine. And, and then I realized it's actually not, not the essence of what his teaching is. So the first time I walked into the DA class, I heard him say, you can't judge a decision from the outcome. <laughs> and so this, this rocked my world because I was coming in from India. And in India, if you, if you, you know, been exposed a little bit to Indian philosophy. It's like from the day you're born, that's what everybody's telling you. Your actions are what you can do. Don't, don't worry about the outcome. Take good action. But the, but the interesting problem there is this is largely a spiritual teaching. So it's like, yes, you're doing your daily work nine to five. And then you think about this teaching. Like, how do you do this? How do you separate yourself from this attachment? So it's, it's, it's like there's this separate life outside of work where you need to think about this. And so when I heard him say this, I walked up to him and said, Professor, this is what Indian philosophy says, that what you just said in class. And he said, yeah, but they didn't tell you how to apply this in finance. <laughs> I was like, shit, <laughs> hell no. <laughs> and that blew my mind. And, and I realized that what he has actually done is the most stupendous achievement in, in, in the intellectual history of mankind. He's taken the highest spiritual idea of detachment and he has snuck it in into the most crass, the most material of pursuits. And can you imagine a feel like accounting? If you practice the way he accounts, you will develop an equanimity and peace. <laughs> you know, if I were to tell this outside this room, people would say, you're smoking weed. I mean, whoa, whoa. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so I feel that you know, if the Indian philosophers were here in this room and they were and they saw what he has managed to do. And this is, by the way, people walking into his class are from all different religious persuasions, atheists even, no problem. And here they are learning through the philosophy of decision analysis how to develop in detachment, how to, and without even talking about the word detachment, which is doing it. So I feel like we're part of a very proud tradition. And the Indian philosophers were here today. I believe they, I think they would probably be taking a bow right now. And the Western philosophers were here. You know, in the West, external freedom is very important. External action, East, internal is very important. And he's bridged the two. I think the Western philosophers might tip their hat and say Atapoy or something like that. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. For that, I'd like to invite Professor Howard. <laughs>
but the, the fundamental thing is it's been a blessing <clears throat> to know the people in my life. Something I didn't deserve, it's been a blessing. And I thank whoever provided this blessing for me. Now there are, there, and I'll comment on some of the things that were said in, in the appropriate place, but there are people in this audience I had in class last week, people I had in class uh, last year, <clears throat> people I had in class a decade ago, and people I had in class decades ago. And you know who you are. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in my 56 years as a professor at MIT, then Stanford, I've estimated there are about 20,000 students that I've met in a class. Uh, in other words, they may have known, seen me in the hall, but, but I've had them in a class. That's a lot of people, 20,000 people. And I, I don't mean doctoral students, there are about 90 of those who've graduated, but people have been in classes of all kinds, professional classes, uh, uh, introductory classes, and so forth. And that's a lot of people you get to touch, and a lot of people you meet in airports in strange places. And uh, the six, the six uh, degrees of connection, it's amazing how often you meet some. I was in your class. Uh, I remember <coughs> we'll be talking about some of the evolutions of companies. And one of them was Resource Planning Associates. And we had a, it was situated here in Cambridge. And uh, this, was about, this was about 1979. And so we flew in to go to the partner meeting. I think there were 13 partners from around the world, including four of us, as you'll see. Uh, and so we, uh, uh, I was at the hotel in, down the river here. And I came out of the hotel, and there was no taxi to be, to be had to go to the, uh, to the to where the board meeting was, or the partners meeting. And, and so uh, we were, everybody's waiting in line, and, and this guy says, uh, <clears throat> uh, you want to share a cab? Where are you going? I said, well, you know, generally Harvard Square. He said, that's great. Let's go. So we got into the cab, and we're riding along, and he says, I was in your class. <laughs> I said, you were? When? He said, well, uh, you know, it was 19, uh, 1958. And I said, what class was that? He said, oh, yeah, that was the, the first uh, circuit theory class. This, this was, I was in electrical engineering. And that, when I uh, became an assistant professor, the first the semester system, first semester I taught this class. And then after that, I always taught a class that I had developed. So this was where I was teaching somebody else's material, uh, all kinds of you know, fundamentals of linear circuits. It was just, Fascinating, but not what I do now. And so I said, well, how was I? Because <laughs> what I like is not the, the teaching evaluation that, you know, I like the 20-year, you know, teaching evaluation. Uh, and this was, gee, this was the 20, 21 years or so. And he said, it was fine. Uh, and I said, oh, great. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm great to meet a student. And then we got out, you know, we shake hands and reminisced, and we got out of the cab. So that's kind of typical. That's the, that's the 20,000. You just never know when you're going to run into one. OK, well, there's many stories like that I could tell, but I want to stay on my purpose here. Uh, I did study electrical engineering at MIT, at, uh, electrical engineering and economics at MIT, and then operations research. There's so many stories here. Uh, I believe I'm the only doctoral student of George Kimball and Philip Morse, who together wrote Methods of Operations Research, which sort of defined the term, I mean, all about their experiences in World War II uh, and about the, the many uh, successes that it had in areas like search. And uh, I remember one which is, should they, uh, if you're dive bombing a uh, ship, do you do it horizontal, you know, along the ship vertically, or do you do it across the ship? you want to sink it. And it's got to do with the errors in both directions and what. Anyway, both great people, very different. Uh, <coughs>
George Kimball was the master of simplicity. I could talk about him for, for quite a while. <clears throat> but he would always, he, he would uh, fall asleep sometimes. This is when I would consult at, uh, in the group at Arthur V. Little where he was the, the senior figure. Uh, he would, uh, we would sometimes have a client meeting and uh, a heavy lunch, you know how that is. And after lunch, we'd be sitting around <clears throat> and listening to uh, uh, the people's views on whatever OR problem we're working on. And then we'd, have, uh, we'd hear a, a snoring sound because George had fallen asleep. Well, no one's going to wake him up. Okay? So, so we continue the meeting. And finally, a voice would come out and say something very insightful. George had awakened. <laughs> and, and he appeared to have been asleep, but he's really working on the problem. And so we used to say that he, he, he did better work when he was asleep than we did when we were awake. <laughs> the, a master of simplicity. Meanwhile, we had Phil Morse, who never saw a differential equation he didn't like. That was giant. They were always big, and you'd beat your way through it. You'd find very different styles and complementary. One is the, the theory style, uh, and the other was, well, let's look at it and see how simple we can make it, and then build from there. Fascinating people to know and to learn from. Now, while I was at MIT, uh, Howard Rafa, whom I had met through, he would stop off at this operations research group at Arthur Little from time to time. He asked me to teach one day a week in a program he had at Harvard called the, we was IBMAB, the Institute of Basic Mathematics for Application to Business. And what he had done to get the Ford Foundation to give him a big chunk of money to have a program at Harvard where business school professors from all over the country, and they had to apply and so forth, uh, could spend a year learning about mathematics, which was pretty much a, a not too common thing in business in those days. And so this was a very successful program. I taught in, as I say, one day a week. I, I did the uh, computer part, and somebody else full-time did probability, and somebody else did optimization, and Howard talked about the decision stuff. Uh, but it was a great opportunity. Many of those graduates went on to become deans in their business schools. They became deans at Harvard Business School, deans at Stanford Business School, and other places. So it was, it was a very uh, transformative program. Uh, and a pleasure to be taking part of it. Now, another teaching thing I did at that time <clears throat> was something called the General Electric Modern Engineering course. And this was a very uh, far-sighted course. What General Electric did was take it, uh, its uh, middle career engineers, so the, the people had been out, you know, 15 years or so, and now had a lot of uh, experience in the company and, and uh, 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 you know, familiarity with company operations. And they said, uh, the head of GE said, you know, what we ought to do is bring these people back for six weeks of uh, learning about modern engineering, because they've, they've been out of school for a while. Uh, and this was a residential program in Saratoga Springs. And I thought, how great that is. Six weeks, residential, in a, in a kind of resorty location, very pleasant, uh, complete. Uh, with, uh, you know, no, no cost to anybody. And in this six weeks, they covered all kinds of things. So I, I taught in one of these weeks, I, I had half of the week, and I taught, uh, you know, markup processes and the dynamic programming, stuff like that. And the other guy that week taught uh, about electromagnetics. Very interesting to see, you know, the derivation of the speed of light from Maxwell's equations and all that good stuff. Anyway, this went on for years, and I met many people at GE. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, another thing that happened, and this will all come together, uh, Bill Linville, whom, who was a professor at MIT, and uh, uh, who, <laughs> I'll tell you about the role of chance in my life sometime, but someone that I really met through event that I thought was a disaster at the time, turned out to be the best thing ever happened to me in my life. Uh, I met him, and he had a profound effect on the rest of my life. Uh, he, uh, first of all, while I was working at Raytheon, which is where I met him for the summer, uh, he said, uh, you know, you really ought to 
look into this operations research group at Arthur D. Little. And he made the introduction. And I don't know how much of you know about the history of that, but that was the premier operations research group in the country, uh, working, taking George Kimball as its uh, uh, you know, leader from the, from the uh, wartime experience. He had been a professor of chemical physics at Columbia, a very highly respected uh, person, member of the National Academy of Sciences, and so forth. So they, they, he had decided to leave academia and become the essentially what would now be the chief technical officer and vice president and so forth at, at uh, Arthur D. Little. And, you know, in addition to my thesis advisor. Anyway, uh, through Bill, I got to meet uh, uh, the people at Arthur D. Little and worked there both as a graduate student uh, and, uh, as a, and as a consultant when I, when I uh, for the rest of my time in uh, the Boston area. Okay, well, this all come, came together because at, uh, uh, at one point, uh, uh, oh, by the way, I've been teaching at, at MIT uh, this, you know, sample data systems and Markov decision processes and uh, statistical decision theory. And if, since, since Carl, you raised this issue, what the heck is statistical decision theory? <clears throat> well, we talked about things like uh, some very fundamental things like <coughs> the uh, uh, work that was done a long time ago, uh, and, and I'm going to be talking about this a little later, by Bernoulli. So where, he's asked, when, when did all this begin? The decision theory part, I mean, we talked about perhaps the probability part going back to Pascal and Fermat earlier. But Bernoulli is where I see the, the first uh, not just glimmer of what we talk about today, but in some sense, a solution to some of the problems that we faced. And Bernoulli was troubled by something called the St. Petersburg paradox, which is easy to explain. Another one of those paradoxes that, that isn't, that we talked about yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> and the idea was if, if you, uh, he, he did it in ducats, but I'll just do it in dollars. But the idea was that if someone comes up to you and says, hey, how about this deal? Uh, I'll give you, suppose let's toss a coin, and if the first uh, head appears uh, on the nth toss, I'll pay you uh, two to the n dollars. So if it's the first, first time the head comes up, then you get, you get uh, a dollar, and then, or two dollars, and at the second time it's uh, four dollars, it doesn't come up till the third time, it's eight dollars, and so forth. Well, you don't have to think about this too long to say that's a heck of a deal. Uh, how much would you be willing to pay for? Well, the answer was, not so much. And yet, if you believe this model of you know, the, the expected value, we don't ooh, wash out my mouth with soap, right? Uh, it would be one plus one plus one plus one, and that goes on forever or so. Anyway, this was a big puzzle to people because this sounds like a wonderful deal, but nobody uh, would pay more than a uh, a few dollars for it. So he tried to explain this, and in explaining of it, he came up with uh, what we would now call logarithmic U-curves and so on, which was a perfectly good explanation, but we can easily spend uh, half an hour, 45 minutes discussing that, which we won't. But, it, but that's the kind of thing that was discussed in class, okay, to understand what he had done in 1738 uh, and uh, how even today people didn't get it. All right, as a matter of fact, some of the people who didn't get it were those ones who said EU is bad, because if they'd read Bernoulli, they would have known they had a big mistake. Anyway, uh, in this, uh, so that's what I was doing at MIT, and then it all came together, because I had been uh, in uh, touch with uh, Bill Linville right along. And by the way, that, that uh, uh, statistical decision theory course was changed fundamentally torn apart and redone after becoming familiar with the work of Ed James, whom I met through Myron Tribus, all these people, very significant figures in my life. And I think of James as the, the cleanest thinker on uncertainty that I know of, and he was certainly the destroyer of paradoxes. Talk about him for quite a while. Now, when Bill Linville went to Stanford, he, from MIT, we, we kept in touch 
And he offered me a sabbatical year, uh, 1964-65 at Stanford, to write uh, my books on dynamic probabilistic systems. I thought this was a hell of a deal. I'm going to go out there for a year uh, with the family and uh, have no, no duties except to write these books. And so I, I took them up on it, and I arrived in June 64 with a wife, four children, and a dog, large dog. And one of the students who had been in the modern engineering course, uh, Sturm Neymark, who was the vice president of GE Nuclear in San Jose that made nuclear reactors, and he said, hey, you know, as long as you're coming out to my area, why don't you teach a course, uh, you know, one afternoon a week down in San Jose? Uh, you know, that stuff we talked about in the, the modern engineering course. I said, great. So I did that. And uh, what I was teaching was, of course, statistical decision theory, including Bernoulli and stuff. So and after a couple of weeks of doing this in the afternoon, uh, somebody came up. I think it was Howard Cook. More about him later. And did exactly what uh, Carl said. He asked, you know, can we, could we apply this decision stuff, because I wasn't saying it wasn't applicable, I was just not, not saying anything about it, to this big decision they had, which was should they place a uh, superheater on their nuclear reactor, which would have you know, significantly improved the efficiency of it, but it would be costly, and I won't go through the whole deal because it's in the paper if you want to read it. Okay, but what happened was we spent several months doing this and a large group of people. I can't tell you all the things that we learned about there, like if you have, uh, two, you have two variables that are relevant and important and you build it into your model, some programmer made to find a fancy way to make them irrelevant, and you wonder why the results are coming out the way they are. <laughs> okay, big mistake. The, the, the program was very proud of how this problem of sampling a joint distribution had become so simple by just sampling the marginal. <laughs> that's, a, if that, if that's a joke. If that's not a joke. <laughs> we'll come to another class, right? OK. Anyway, uh, this went on. And uh, uh, it, it went very well. And so I was going to write it up. And Howard Rafe invited me to make a presentation in a uh, session at the Boston, back to Boston again, I think it was a, an Orson meeting. He was the chair of the session. And uh, so I said, I'd, I'd be happy to do that. And uh, I had to choose a title. Uh, and so I chose uh, decision analysis, colon, applied decision theory, or as we call it now, D-A-A-P-D-T. Uh, now, I didn't really like, I was thinking of decision engineering, which would be more descriptive, but that sounded manipulative. You know, we're going to engineer your decision. It's going to come out the way we want it to. So I stuck with decision analysis. Okay, now who has read that paper? Not everybody, right? You may have heard about it. Uh, well, I decided to go through and take a look at it again and see uh, how time has dealt with what I wrote. Now, the, as I said, I'm not going to talk about, you know, what were the distributions and blah, 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 the methods, but just some of the more general things. And so I'll quote, I'm reading from it now. The purpose of this article is to outline a formal procedure for the analysis of decision problems, a procedure that I call decision analysis. We shall also discuss several of the practical problems that arise when we attempt to apply the decision analysis formalism. Now, these are paragraphs, this is not the in succession paragraphs, just sample paragraphs. Decision analysis is a logical procedure for the balancing of the factors that influence a decision. The procedure incorporates uncertainties, values, preferences, and a basic structure that models the decision. Typically, it includes technical, marketing, competitive, and environmental factors. The essence of the procedure is the construction of a, const of a structural model of the decision and a form suitable for computation and manipulation. The realization of this model is often a set of computer programs. Another paragraph. Having defined a decision, let us clarify the concept by drawing a necessary distinction between a good decision and a good outcome. <laughs> no kidding, right? <laughs> Why didn't anybody ever think of that? 
A good decision is a logical decision, one based on the uncertainties, values, and preferences of the decision maker. A good outcome is one that is profitable or otherwise highly valued. In short, a good outcome is one that we wish would happen. Hopefully, by making good decisions all the situation, in all the situations that face us, we shall ensure as high a percentage as possible of good outcomes. We may be disappointed to find that a good decision has produced a bad outcome or dismayed to learn that someone who has made what we consider to be a bad decision has enjoyed a good outcome. Yet pending the invention of the true clairvoyant, he was there too, we find no better alternative in the pursuit of good outcomes than to make good decisions. Further on, another criticism is, if this is such a good idea, why haven't I heard of it before? <laughs> Did that ever happen? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> we're talking 1950, 1964. One very practical reason is that the operations we conduct in the course of a decision analysis would be expensive to carry out without using computers. Think about that. In that, in that first decision analysis, in order to do a calculation, you, you, had to carry, you had to carry it to the high priest of the computing department. Okay, this was, this was just beyond the punch card era. My, when I was a doctoral student, we, I carried my punch cards to the sacred machine at MIT, and you did your bows and so forth. Uh, but this was not that much later. And even at a company like General Electric, which made computers, you didn't do this yourself. You had somebody who served you, or maybe you served them. You know, can you run this again? I mean, you remember yesterday, I, I can't do the simulation as fast as... <laughs> I can't get my button, figure out the button as fast as it does another 3,000. Oh, man, you know, this, this is like y your father telling you how, how far he walked to school. <laughs> uh, they, they must have gotten great exercise in the old days. Okay. Uh, okay. It's a good idea. One practical we wouldn't have computers. To this extent, decisional analysis is a product of our technology. And I'll just insert there, you know, think about what Laplace would have done. If you read his books, the major one on probability and the others on, on decision making and, and more, more common uh, everyday life, annuities and things like that, think of what he could have done if he had had a computer. And sometimes they say, you know, suppose. Suppose he arrived, he suddenly awakes 202 years later or something like that, and, and he says, oh, guy, look, you know, I, I could have, I thought that you'll be doing this now. I mean, what do you use for computation? I mean, do you have something better than the abacus? Oh, yeah, man, look at this, zip, 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 zip. And he says, what's your excuse? You know, I had all the ideas, and it was 200 years ago. That gets me another story of why why, how long it took me to get a copy of his book from the libraries of the United States. Most important book on probability ever written. But another story, not gonna get into that. Anyway, what's our excuse? To have this computational ability and not be implementing the things that he foresaw uh, over 200 years ago. Okay, <clears throat> uh, there, there are other answers in addition to the technology. One is that the idea of probability as a state of mind and not of things is only now regaining its proper place in the world of thought. Boy, was that optimistic. <laughs> only now? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, right. The opposing heresy lay heavy on the race for the better part of a century. And a half. <laughs> we should note that most of the operations research performed in World War II required mathematical and probabilistic concepts that were readily available to Napoleon. Okay? Even that was not new stuff. By the way, uh, Laplace's book on probability was dedicated to Napoleon in the most obsequious fashion. One wonders about how the introduction of formal methods for decision making at that time might have affected the course of history. Well, guess what? <laughs> We're still not doing it. We still have the decider who probably has never seen a probability distribution in his life. Thus, the decision analysis is a vital structure that lets us compare at any time the values of such alternatives as acting, postponing action, and buying information, 
of refusing to consider the problem further. We must remember that the analysis is always based on the current state of knowledge. Overnight, there can arrive a piece of information that changes the nature of the conclusions entirely. Of course, having captured the basic structure of the problem, we're in an excellent position to incorporate any such information. Here we go. One aid in reducing the problem to its fundamental components is restricting the vocabulary that can be used in discussing the problem. Thus, we carry on the discussion in terms of events, random variables, probabilities, density functions, expectations, outcomes, and alternatives. We do not allow fuzzy thinking about the nature of these terms. Thus, quote, the density function of the probability, end quote, and quote, the confidence in the probability estimate, end quote, must be nipped in the bud. We speak of assigning, in quotes, not estimating probabilities. The probabilities of events, and, and think of this assignment as based on our, quote, state of information, end quote. These conventions eliminate statements like the one recently made on a TV panel of doctors who were discussing the right of a patient to participate in decision making uh, and, and with, and with respect to his treatment. One doctor asserted that the patient should be told of quote, some kind of a chance of a likelihood of a bad result, end quote. You ever have a doctor talk to you like that? I'm sure the doctor was a victim of the pressures of the program would agree with us that telling the patient the probability the doctor would assign to a bad result would be preferable. One of the most important advantages of decision analysis lies in the way it encourages meaningful communication among the members of the enterprise because it provides a common language in which to discuss decision problems. Thus, engineers and marketing planners with different jargons can appreciate one another's contributions to a decision. Both can use the decision analysis language to convey their feelings to management quickly and effectively. There are examples of that in the paper. Other arguments over which is the best decision arise because the participants do not realize they're arguing on different grounds. Thus, it is possible for A to think that a certain alternative is riskier than it is in B's opinion, either because A assigns different probabilities to the outcomes than B, but both are equally risk averting, or because A and B assign the same probability to the outcomes but differ in their risk aversion. We are to make progress in resolving the argument. We must identify the nature of the difficulty and bring it into the open. Similar clarifications may be made in the areas of time preference or the measurement of the value of outcomes. Now, now that, that confusion between uh, how is the riskiness of the deal in the information leg or in the preference leg, that came up for the board much after this was written. For example, though we have tended to think of the of utility theory as an academic pursuit, one of our major companies was recently faced with the question, is $10 million worth of profit sufficient to incur one in one million chance of losing $1 billion? Though the loss is staggering, it is realistic for the company concerned. Should such a large company be risk indifferent and make decisions on an expected value basis? Are stockholders responsible for diversifying their risk externally to the company, or should the company be risk averting on their behalf? Now, we've all here thought about these things. For the first time, the company faced these questions in a formal way rather than deciding the particular question on its own merits, and this we must regard as a step forward. Oh, yeah. Okay. And finally, decision analysis is no more than a procedure for applying logic. The ultimate limitation to its applicability lies not in its ability to cope with problems, but in man's desire to be logical. Guess what? Still true. OK, now, you can determine for yourself whether all these things are still true. Now I'm not going to read any more paragraphs. So those in yesterday's courses will see that my thinking about language has progressed over the years. And there are other refinements, if I were writing that today, that I would make. And you should know what they are since yesterday. But since then, we've, I've learned many important truths that can be succinctly expressed without equations. And you know, some of it is as simple as the good decisions never become bad and bad decisions never become good. It's the same story we told before. But I know a woman who, was, uh, <coughs> who, who lost her husband and then got remarried and after 10 years divorced this person. 
And she used to say, well, it was a bad decision to marry this guy. But now she knows that it was a good decision to marry him and a good decision to divorce him. Now think about that. See, that's clarity of thinking. Because sometimes things change. Buying IBM stock at one point could be a good decision, and selling it another time could be a, a bad decision, or a good one. Okay, it's got nothing to do with the quality of the first one. But that's human nature, and, it, and it's a learning, and it's, it's actually very refreshing in your thoughts to be able to say, hey, you know, all I gotta do is make good decisions, and I don't worry about anything else. And if you make good decisions, there's no regret or worry, you can be very calm and placid in your, in your uh, uh, demeanor. I've, I heard the statement recently, and I'm going to adopt it. Worrying is praying for what you don't want to happen. Worrying is praying for what you don't want to happen. Now, that says it all. Okay? Any time you, any attention you give to worrying is praying for what you don't want it to happen. I just I was thinking about how, how is that confirmed? Well, suppose you're skiing and you give your attention to all the trees and rocks that you may hit and worried about. Does that make you a good skier? Now, any coach will tell you you're supposed to visualize the right way to go down, not all the hazards that might kill you. Any attention you give to those is taking away from doing the right thing. And I'm sure any, any extreme sports person, you know, the guy who's, who's uh, free climbing on the face of Yosemite isn't saying, you know, I could fall and kill myself. I could fall and kill myself. I mean, to us, that's, what is he going to fall? Man, how the hell is he going to do it? And, but to him, he's just focusing on what's so and not what might happen. Great peace of mind in doing that. Okay, now, if you're, if you end up still worrying, we'll just put those, that same energy uh, into making a better decision. Okay? So anytime you find yourself worrying, say, you know, I can possibly improve my decision. Let's make it better. Okay? Maybe you have to find a new alternative, whatever it takes. So regret, we talk about worry. Regret also is a waste of your time and your life. Uh, and I heard this on, in a radio announcement once, it's always stuck with me. It said, the past is a canceled check. Does anybody know what that is? <laughs> Someday they'll say, dial the phone. <laughs> you know, canceled check, what are you talking about? But I remember boxes of canceled checks, and you could go through them. Say, oh, yeah, I remember. That's where I paid for the time we went to uh, Europe, you know, and that was a great vacation. Oh, that's what I put that refrigerator. The damn thing broke after. You could spin a whole story out of your canceled checks. And that, that's, you know, reflection. on. But guess what? That, that's about how important it is for your future. All that stuff is a, a big story about your life, but it's about your past life. It's done. You can't change it. You never make a decision about the past. And the other part of that was the past is a canceled check, and you have no claim on the future. We could all be dead tomorrow from radiation under the table. I warned you. Did you look? <laughs> Bring your Geiger counter. <clears throat> How many people here own a Geiger counter? <laughs> I don't know if I could find it, but I built one from a Heath kit. Okay, now, when do you think about, and other things, when do you think about the desirability of the prospects, the things that might happen? Well, you want to think about that before you make the decision, or as you're making it. You know, how much do I like these different things that might happen? Because I want to do the best I can. But suppose now one of these happens. Is there any point in thinking of the quality of what happened? Total waste of time. So if I, if I make an operation, have an operation, decide to do it, one possible outcome might be uh, one of my legs, my right leg is amputated. 
Now I'm thinking about, you know, right leg amputated, you know, getting better, all these different prospects, and I've made the decision to have the operation. Uh, maybe they won't have to amputate, I've got the probability. Guess what, they had to take the leg off. Now, is there any point of thinking about that as the bad outcome? No, you're beginning life as a one-leg person, right? You may save on your shoes. <laughs> you're gonna have hopping practice. So you can feel good, you still got one. <laughs> Right? You can ski with one leg, do all kinds of things, one leg or even none. So thinking about, I got the bad outcome, another total waste of time. But we do it. No, remember, these are no equation stories. Equation stories we can look, we did yesterday. No equation stories today. There, there's a, a, a saying in medicine, the operation was a success, uh, but the patient died. That's not a joke. Happens all the time. If you made a good decision to have the operation, they didn't you know, leave utensils inside you or cut off the wrong leg by mistake or something like that. Everything went fine. People still die. It's not like uh, you know, the predictable what's going to happen. So you may make an excellent decision to have an operation and you might die on the table. And I know people who have had that result. Another realization, which we haven't talked about here, the recognition of what I call big D decisions. Big D decisions are where the person experiencing the results is not the same person who made the decision and it's going to have with different preferences and so forth, almost predictively, but usually they don't think about it. Now, what's a big D decision? Well, one is marriage, okay? Now, think of, think, I, was look, I looked up marriage vows in Wikipedia. Oh, by the way, I, I'm still carrying the thing that Salmik talked about, so careful what you say to me. Uh, basically, the, the, the vows go, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, and sickness and in health for as long as we both shall live. Now think about a lawyer's view of that. That's the dumbest contract you could ever imagine. There's no way to get out of it except by dying. Why would you ever do that? And yet people are doing it all the time, I guarantee, right? Even though we know of statistically that half of them uh, don't work out quite that way, okay? But notice that, be, that if you don't think of marriage that way, then it's basically thinking of marriage like you would select a roommate, or a flatmate is probably a better way to put it. Somebody wants to move in with you and you know, share your expenses. What are your questions about this person? Uh, will they pay the rent? Uh, will they not be messy? Not make too much uh, noise? Think about it. That's what a prenuptial agreement is all about. It's all, you know, I want to be protected against the things that I'm worried about. Notice there's no protection in the traditional marriage vows. So if you enter into that, uh, you are going to be transformed by having done it, hopefully. Otherwise, you're selecting a flatmate. I remember, you know, when you're younger, you think about rating people and all that kind of stuff. Total waste of time, because their people are infinite. They are they're like vectors with infinite components. You can't compare them in any way, saying this is better than that, higher, longer. No, you just can't do it. Now, another one <coughs> is uh, having children. Okay? In other words, why would anybody have a child today? What's college tuition? <laughs> you know, 60,000 a year, 70 by the time you get them boarded and all that kind of stuff. I mean, you're looking at uh, over a quarter of a million dollars per child. How many do you want? Okay? And will they restrict your activities, the things you can't do and so forth, not just, you know, babysitters and and uh, taking them to soccer practice and all that kind of stuff. Big drag. And yet, 
making the decision now by, by any method that we know would be silly because you are transformed by the experience. So don't use decision analysis to decide whether to get married or have children. Remember, you, you heard it here. For your, for your wealth and your health, no problem. Works great. But for matters like that, no. Now, I've got some guidelines that I follow to keep myself where I want to be. One is telling the truth. Sounds simple, <clears throat> but you often have to dig deep into yourself to figure out what the truth is. And it also means that it's, it's okay to keep secrets, but you better think about which secrets you're really going to keep because they will change your relationship with other people. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> One of my children, and you can guess who it was from yesterday, used to ask people how much money they made in a social gathering. And his, uh, his brothers would say, no, you just don't do that, right? I mean, that's not what you do. And he'd say, why not? If they want to tell me, you don't have to tell me. Perfectly logical, right? But we know there's a, it's, it's more than that, okay? But in a sense, he was absolutely right. You don't have to, if someone, someone asks you something that you, uh, uh, want to keep secret or pledge to keep secret, you just say, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. And you don't have to go further than that. Although there's also a, 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 a worthy longer discussion about the decision to keep something secret. And we don't have time uh, to get into that now. Okay, let's see. We, we, uh, Yes, as a matter of fact, in this business of uh, 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 telling the truth, one of my doctoral students, Clint Korber, who many of you know, and who wrote the ethics book with me, uh, was introduced at a conference as, you know, a conference like that, a man who tells the truth. Imagine him telling, <laughs> you know. I mean, why does such an introduction have to be made? This is, I, I, I should be... Uh, uh, it, it should be as expected as, quote, a man whose breath fogs a mirror. <laughs> I mean, imagine that, right? But this was astounding. I mean, that somebody introduced, and it's absolutely true in my experience, he tells the truth. It's one of his guidelines, too. A good man to write a book on ethics with, right? Uh, but it's, it, the fact that it was uncommon enough to have to mention it uh, should be of concern to all of us who are living in this uh, professional world. And I've learned to be, avoid value-laden and leading uh, questions in, in learning. Don't you think this is a good idea? <laughs> Don't you think I look slim in this dress? See, in the court of law, we, we, we are warned against these, these kinds of questions. But it ought to be true in your thinking, too. Don't use value-laden terms. There are some, some terms that have built the answer into it. What kind of pollution do you favor? <laughs> you see, if you said, what kind of emissions do you favor? I favor carbon dioxide. And so do you, or you'd be dead right now, right? <laughs> I mean, it changes the conversation entirely when you avoid these terms. OK. <clears throat> now, there's some other things. And I, I shouldn't have to say this to anyone, but it, there are truths that sometimes we forget. Oh, by the way, in ethics, we're, we're, we're not just talking about truth. We're not talking, we're talking about not stealing or harming people, but that's, most of, that's not the temptations that most of us face. Most of us not think, shall I be a mugger tonight? See, there are groups where it's, you know, why not, right? <laughs> but it's not this group. So our temptations are about truth-telling. How long is this project going to cost? And take, and how much is it going to cost? 
well, maybe he won't give me it. I better make it a phase one, and then when, he, when he's into it and I've got all his data, then he'll go for phase two, right? We know that, and yeah, forget it. Okay, <clears throat> uh, new guideline. You're the only person uniquely equipped to be you. Even if you share the DNA. It's kind of interesting, Bill Linville had a twin brother, John. And Bill was the chair of the department I was in, and John was the chair of electrical engineering at Stanford. They were completely different people. Different in many different ways. If you knew both, you'd never mistake the two, okay? Even though they had the same DNA. Because they had developed in different ways and so forth. So, so there's no, there was no one, you would never mistake one for the other. Okay, once you know them. And, and from the kind of, of uh, w w the kind of behavior you might think would be forthcoming from each of them. So no one, no one is, uh, is no one else who is more uniquely equipped to be you. That's very important in taking advice. Okay, here's another one that I believe in. Don't do it if it's not fun. Don't do it if it's not fun. I tell my doctoral students when, they, when they're working on their thesis, they're gonna be, is it fun? If it's not fun, they won't, they'll be miserable. And if it's fun, when you finally find a topic that you can't wait to get back to, then it's a, it's a pleasure. But that's true of work and the professions and the, the deals we get into. And it's not about money, it's about people. We'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. <laughs> because if, if you, with this maxim of don't do it if it's not fun, if you enjoy what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Kind of, you know, they pay me for this? <laughs> That's a really good deal. Okay? But you don't do it because you're paid for it. You do it because it's fun for you to do it. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Now, here's something to think about. I learned this relatively late. Do you believe what you experience or experience what you believe? Do you believe what you experience or experience what you believe? There's a story of an old man standing at the age of town. He's approached by a stranger. Stranger says, uh, you know, what are the people like in this town? And uh, the old man says, well, you know, uh, where, where, where'd you come from? What were they like there? He said, boy, they're a bunch of thieves. You know, they'd steal the eye out of your head. They would, you know, had to watch yourself in every transaction. Uh, no one would give you a helping hand. Uh, it was just terrible. And the old man said, I think you'll find them just about the same here. And then another stranger approached with the same question. And the old man gave the same uh, question to him. What were they like when you came? Oh, they're wonderful people. Give you the shirt off your back. Uh, you'll never be wanting here. You'll have a friend in everyone. I think you'll find them the same here. Now think about the way that you introduce someone to someone else sets them up for the experience of that person. Just think about it. Here's, here's person X you can introduce. Here's one of the finest people I know, ethical, professionally competent, a friend. He meets the ultimate test. The ultimate test is if you were, if you were uh, uh, arrested for child abuse or even worse, pedophilia, would he come and bail you out? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the real test of a friend. So he knows you so well, he knows there's, there's something wrong here. Okay? So if, if that's the case, you see, then, then you're going to have a very high expectation of what meeting this person is going to be. Suppose you say, here's, I'm going to introduce this guy. I really don't trust him. <laughs> you know, I have business real dealings with him, and I, I keep one hand on my wallet. Now meet my, my associate, Joe. Well, do you think his experience of these people are going to be the same? Of course not. So most of us, <clears throat> uh, 
experience what we believe to be so. Okay? In other words, we, 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 if we change our beliefs, we change our experience. But we think that we are just forming our, our beliefs by what we've experienced. So the secret is that to be able to manage your beliefs, to create the beliefs for you that are the ones you want to have. So suppose, and, and you know, there's, there are technologies for doing this I can't get into, but they're extremely powerful. So suppose you say, you know, I, I want to write the great American novel, and I think I could do it, but oh darn, I got a C in English. I'm lousy at spelling. See, all these other beliefs that you have that you think are inconsistent. Well, guess what? You can write the great American novel, and, and even if you got a C in English, even if you, if you can't spell, but creating the belief that you can will create changes in you as long as you get rid of all these other ones that are competing with that first one that are transforming. So the power of creating the beliefs that serve you is immense. I've gone through this process probably 20 years ago and it is amazing, amazing. Okay, now another example of that is um, the story that I'm sure most of you have heard about the time in several years ago, I think it was in San Francisco, where in uh, uh, transforming from one class to another, you're going to the fourth to the fifth grade or whatever it was, somehow the children's locker numbers got filled into the space where their IQs were supposed to be. So you could never, you could never do this as an experiment, but it happened. Well, guess what? It really changed the grades of the kids with the high locker numbers. Okay, now how could that be? You know, they're getting, last year they were down here and, and vice versa, right? How could this happen? The, you know, the kids didn't even know <laughs> anything about the locker numbers affecting what was going on. And the teacher thought uh, she was looking at IQs. Okay, now think how that would change the experience. I'm trying to imagine, right? Uh, so here, let's uh, just suppose low locker number, i.e. dumb Johnny, comes up to the teacher uh, and says, uh, you know, teacher, you know, six times nine is nine times six. And she responds, great, now learn the rest of the table. Okay, now smart Johnny comes up High locker number says six times nine is nine times six. Oh, great! You've got the, you know the the transitivity of multiplication. Great, Johnny. Praise, right? You know, in other words, the way you respond depends on what you who you believe you're talking to. Okay. Now that I made that up, right? But you can just see how this the same response from someone you don't have a high opinion of seems simplistic, and from another person you have a Oh, they've really got to the essence of it. <laughs> okay. Same word. Okay, moving on. I believe, and Somic uh, <laughs> gave you a little evidence, you can learn from anyone. You can learn from anyone, no matter what their official title, position, role, no matter what it is. Now, there's a, there's a little proviso in there. Provi which, which is this, providing that they're speaking from their own deep knowledge, or what I call that ex cathedra. In other words, there's things that they, they're aware of, and other things that they're speaking from their true knowing. And you have to detect when that's happening, because even they may not know. But when they are, that, those are golden things. And I've been examples of this in my life. Uh, a couple of my teachers, by teacher to me is not, is not the, uh, something that they wear uh, you know, on a label. They could be driving a bus, they could be doing anything. Uh, but one of them was a body man. <clears throat> he was a guy who put together, uh, who, who fixed and uh, put together uh, cars with their dented, crashed, and whatnot. And in, that, in those days, I had a, a Porsche that uh, I knew the Porsche dealer, and 
Palo Alto. And I, I, I had a ding in my old, uh, my 62 Porsche. And so I asked, uh, you know, wh where should I take this? And he said, well, you know, we have a body shop here uh, in Porsche at Palo Alto, but I just want you to know when, when we get a car dinged on the boat, we don't take it to our own body shop. We take it to this guy, you know, over here, because he does a better job, okay? Now, don't tell anybody I told you, right, in <laughs> here, but, you know, that's where I take it. So I went over to, to uh, this shop run by Jeff Stainton, and he, he fixed my, <clears throat> my dent, no sweat, and I watched him do it, and I saw how, how careful he was. And so I said, okay, I want to learn more. And he said, well, come on back anytime. And he, we went through his 23-step you know, process for refinishing. And each stage, I said, why do you do that? Well, you know, I tried this, but that does, this is the way to really. And you know, he's dealing with very expensive cars, and their beauty you wouldn't know the thing happens. As a matter of fact, one day, uh, I went over there, and because you know, I knew he was my teacher. And he said uh, a couple of things. One is, uh, he, he said, how'd you like to go for a ride in this BMW? I said, great. And so we go out and around the block, and I said, wow, it's really neat. He said, well, last week, the front end was one BMW, and the back end was another. Now, think about the expertise. He did all this himself. Okay? He could put the two halves together and all the mechanics and everything else, and you'd never know. Another time, he was... Uh, he was uh, doing the car, the undercarriage, or the steering parts and so forth for, for a hot rod that his uh, friend had made, had, had him paint. Uh, and I noticed while he's talking to me that he's going through the 23 steps on uh, steering couplings and things like this. I mean, they're magnificent. And I said, Jeff, you know, no one's ever going to see these. No one's ever going to know that they are finished to the same beauty that the fenders are. He says, I'll know. Okay, so he was a true craftsman. He, he was what it meant to be a craftsman. And he it was one of the big lessons I learned from him, and that was, uh, I was listening to the telephone conversation, and it was pretty clear that, that uh, this company that he was uh, used to getting parts from was telling him that now that he'd have to pay cash in advance for his parts, they'd change their policy and so forth. And after a while, he said, look, do business with me or don't do business with me, but don't jerk me around. And I thought, that's right. And now, ever since, when I'm in a situation where I think you know, people are sort of kicking the tires, I'll, I'll say it in a little more genteel way, but that's the message. In other words, you're wasting my time. Are we going to do business or do whatever or not? Because I have better things to do. Okay? Good lesson. Now, as he was teaching me these things about craftsmanship and about being straight with people, he was speaking ex cathedra, as I said. Now, he's speaking from his deep knowledge. Now, there are other aspects of his life I'd never learned from. For example, he was so intent on on his work, but they, he sort of neglected his wife and she took up with somebody else and so forth. So these people who are teaching you, it doesn't mean you copy everything they do. Only when they're speaking from their true knowledge. I had that same experience with a Buddhist teacher. One of the, it was, uh, there's a, a Buddhist teacher called Chogyam Trungpa and he was, he got out of uh, Tibet and uh, went to, college in England, very learned man, written many books, fairly excellent books. And uh, he had selected someone who was going to be his successor in the United States. And this successor, while the Chogyam could wear a business suit, he usually was in you know, Tibetan uh, garb, uh, and his successor looked like an IBM salesman. Remember what IBM salesmen used to look like? They'd, they'd have a hat, you know, a suit, I mean, they... They never looked sloppy. They were never wearing T-shirts or anything like that. Well, this guy would dress like that. And, and, and he's delivering the, the Buddhist message. And when he did, uh, it was very, very moving when he was speaking in that message. Uh, so once I heard him talk, and, 
And he was talking about the, you know, the tenets of Buddhism and what you believed as a Buddhist. And one of the women in the audience said, well, you know, I was, a, uh, I was raised as a Christian and, and my, in my church we had charitable collections every Sunday, you know, to help the people in other parts of the world. And, and you haven't talked about charity. And he asked her, he said, well, do you care about these people that you're sending these goods to? And she was taken aback. She said, uh, no. And he said, well, when you care, you'll know what to do. Very simple. Okay? Very simple message. And other things that I won't get into. And in spite of being able to talk in this very clear way, on things that he really knew, he ended up, uh, years later, Edmund he was found out to have been uh, consorting with the younger boys who were in studying Buddhism, and he ended up uh, dying of AIDS. So clearly he was not living, he was not speaking ex cathedra if he gave you advice about that. So in each case, you could learn from this person when he was speaking from his true knowledge, but you better not you better not uh, b believe in other things that they're saying or doing because they're not speaking uh, from what they really know. Making good decisions is great, but the most important part of life's experience, most important parts are the, the people that you meet. And most of these occurrences are not the result of decisions. Okay? No one's ever decided to meet their best friend. Now think about that, right? <laughs> you, all of you got best friends, and was there some decision process that led you to today? I'm going to meet my best friend. You know, it's going to be about two o'clock. I think I'll be sure I'm there on time. Or the spouse, your spouse. You know, you. Wow. So the most important things you really have no, nothing to do with, and drawing giant trees and all that's not going to do you any good. They're not the result of decisions. You know, I've been very fortunate in that respect, <clears throat> and. Uh, Two of the people in this room I have known for just about as long as decision analysis or longer. And I want to say just a few words about them. Uh, one is Jim Matheson. Uh, I've known him since I met him during a visit I made to Stanford uh, before my sabbatical. I gave a talk on Markov decision processes and one of the students had questions that persisted after the uh, lecture and we went out and sat. And Pretty soon I offered him a position at the MIT OR Center where I was the associate director uh, and he told me that he was already committed to work at Westinghouse. And so we stayed in touch and he actually uh, hired me as a consultant at Westinghouse during that sabbatical year. So uh, when I stayed at Stanford and Bill Linville, uh, and, and with Bill Linville started a clinical uh, program at the, uh, at SRI, as it was called then. Uh, Jim came out after a short while and became the leader of what became the decision analysis group. And that was the first group that I know of providing consulting services in this uh, new field. And uh, uh, of course, uh, Jim is going to be presenting uh, very soon, so you'll hear more about the details of that. Uh, but that was, uh, that was mo monumental, okay? And, and you know, uh, David, uh, Jim's son, will be presenting uh, very soon uh, in this session. So a lot of connections, right? And, and of course, Jim and David now are in SmartOrg, and by the way, that is where Somic uh, is working now, uh, to, to I'm sure his and, and their satisfaction. And I'm beginning a sabbatical in a, in a day or two, and uh, Jim Matheson will be teaching my advanced class at Stanford, again, uh, which he has done before. So think about this, you know, 50 years, but we still have all these connections, and they're, they're continually uh, entwined. You know, you met uh, Jim's daughter, Amy, whom I've known for some time, since she was <laughs> literally, <laughs> you know, as small as she could be, and that's, uh, these are blessings to know people over a lifetime and see their development. Well, I met Carl Spetzler after a talk I gave in Mexico City in 1966 when I was president of TIMS. And uh, 
Long story short, Jim and I had invited Carl to join the SRI decision analysis group, and he did, and he advanced rapidly uh, at, within SRI, both professionally and managerially. In uh, about 79, Carl surprised us, I'm really abbreviating here, uh, by leaving SRI uh, and then becoming a partner in a company called Resource Planning Associates. Okay, remember I mentioned that before. Uh, soon, Carl approached us to join him. Uh, I remember the three of us sitting in a car for hours talking about it. Because Jim and I were, we had this deal, you know, at SRI we're very comfortable, you know, change is difficult, a lot of friends and so forth. And, uh, well, what can I say? We had no chance, choice, chance, because we, we joined our RPA as partners. Now, why was that? Well, we had a belief expressed at the time, which is true to this day, that Carl could talk dogs out of a meat wagon. Remember that, Jim? <laughs> I mean, you don't have a chance, right? So, so we, were, we were saying, Carl got me here, all of that stuff at the beginning, right? I had no chance. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, we have no complaints either. We're happy, happy dogs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Now, the three of us, plus uh, Jeff Foran, founded SDG about a year later. Uh, and then, long story, uh, then, and Carl and I joined forces uh, more recently, this, uh, in 2006, to start the Strategic Decision Risk Management Program at Stanford, where I represent uh, Stanford and Carl represents SDG. And that's been very smooth operation and, and a lot of fun. So there, there are many, by the way, there are many ties among the three of us. Uh, in the audience, two of my former doctoral students and head teaching assistants, uh, Somic, who, as I said, joined uh, SmartOrg, and Brad, you out there, Brad? I saw you before, there he is, Brad Powler, Powley, uh, and he's joined SDG. And, and, and you know, there's no manipulation here. They both interviewed in all kinds of places, right, Brad? And I'm sure that's true of Somic, too. Uh, and, you know, guess what? One ended up working for uh, Jim's company and the other uh, for Carl's. Okay, now, others in the audience, you know, are, are David Matheson, right? And uh, uh, Eric Bickle. And Eric has had an association with SDG for uh, a long time, off and on. So it's a, uh, a very tight group. And I'm, I'm honored to have two of my doctoral students, uh, Eric and Ali Abbas, my, the co-author of the book I'm writing, uh, competing to be president of the Decision Analysis Society of Inform. See, that's, that's a how can you lose situation, right? <laughs> and they didn't know they were running against each other, which was kind of interesting. Now, my long ties with Jim and Carl are not only professional, we've taken uh, many vacations, bear boat sailing trips with our families to the Greek Isles, Tahiti, Tonga, British Virgins, and Australia. And that's when you really get to know people. And at a recent conversation with a venture capitalist at, at actually the Clint Corvus House, we agreed the reason most startups fail is the chemistry of the people involved. And but we could go into chapter and verse on that. But it's, it's not some business problem or technical failure. It's somehow these people were not of one mind and pulling in the same direction. I can give you examples, but I won't in the interest of time. And in the SRI days, we had a, a little mantra that went, people, problems, and profits. Okay? And the idea was, when you're working with the right people, and we knew we're working with the right people, and you're working on something that motivates all, you all want to learn about this and do it, then you don't have to worry about the profit. They'll come, okay? And that's always been true. It, so let's uh, put it this way. With the right problem, right people, you're gonna have fun, you're gonna enjoy your work, and you're gonna make a good living. 
And, and you don't have to worry. Remember worry? Right? You don't have to worry about it. It's just going to happen. So people, for me, are number one. And then doing things that are fun, the right work for you, learning work. Uh, and then you don't worry about whether you're going to be OK financially or not. Because we know that money won't buy happiness. Happiness is a decision, right? We discussed that yesterday. OK. Um, as I say here, uh, th this having, having fun and uh, enjoying yourself, making a good living, that's, a, as Hamlet would say, a consummation devoutly to be wished. All right, uh, almost done. Uh, so decision analysis has no, no bearing on my being uh, uh, appointed as a full professor at Stanford. The, the, the dean, when he entered me, didn't know what the hell I did. It was, <laughs> and, and he's kind of, what's this markup process stuff? Well, you know, I guess it, it, it's okay. Uh, and so, but I've never taught the statistical decision theory again, any of that stuff. Uh, I've never taught markup processes. I wrote the book, but uh, haven't really done it. It was a great field, left it behind, good stuff, more practical now than it ever was because of, of the availability of data that was very scarce in the old days. Now, Safeway knows more about my shopping habits than I do. Okay, but since then, I developed not only decision analysis, but uh, new interests in ethics and freedom, and those continue to this day. Now, time to do some thanking. <clears throat> I've got to thank my seventh grade teacher, Ms. Shaney, who taught me arithmetic and English. Very powerful. You know, when you're waiting, watching somebody at a checkout counter with a laser and all this, and trying to figure out what this person who's bought, you know, two items at $9.98, you know, what could that be? <laughs> thank you, Ms. Shaney. <laughs> I didn't have to get out my phone. <laughs> And then I had a ninth grade English teacher who asked me what I was reading. Uh, and I told her, and not, nothing very impressive. So she spent her lunch hour uh, writing out on a, on a shorthand book a list of books and authors that I should read on her own time. Right? And I still have it. I have, I have the sheet in my archive. And I just read all those books. And it was terrific. And you know, how often does that happen? This wasn't on the curriculum, blah, blah, blah. Public high school, Liberal high school, nothing fancy. Finally, from that period of Limbrook, I have to thank my chemistry and physics teacher, Mr. Carr, who gave me invaluable guidance. I'll tell you that story. It's either it, uh, the, uh, it was a time to figure out where I was going to go to college. And uh, the principal of the school went to Union College in New York. It, it's, it's a very fine old school. It's where fraternities were started and so forth. I'm sure a very good school. And he was assured I'd be getting you know, support to go there. He really wanted me to go. And my mother favored Princeton because she'd heard about it. <laughs> Big name college, right? And I remember talking to Mr. Carr. And I told him, I said, what do you think I should do? He said, you should go to MIT. And I said, uh, why? He said, no question. That's where you should go. I mean, this is, not, this is a slam dunk, OK? And I did. And I'll tell you why in a moment. But the, because uh, we were poor. So that was just like select a college, no problem, right? Uh, but that was his advice. And he gave me trust in a public high school that I can't imagine today. He gave me run of the chemistry laboratory after school, unsupervised. I had toluene, I had nitric acid, I could have made TNT. I did make hydrogen, blow up balloons, did ferment uh, stuff to get out, make alcohol, all kinds of things, right? Unsupervised. Now think about that, that'd be a scandal, you know, today. Student allowed to have dangerous chemicals. He could have drunk the sulfuric acid. Oh, man, you know. Of course I could. You'd have to be a village idiot to do it, but, uh, you know, <laughs> you could do it, right? And you could get into all kinds of mischief with these supplies. But, you know, I was, had no intention of, of getting him in any trouble. And I just was going through these experiments that were suggested in a book, and I could do it all by myself. And some of them took a week. 
you know, like the fermentation and whatnot. And I just can't imagine that today. I mean, what a gift. I could have, I could have gone to some very expensive prep school. I doubt they would have, I would have had that experience. But this was good old Limbrook Public High School where I graduated. So thank you, Mr. Carr. And of course, I have to thank uh, Bill Linville, who had enhanced my life uh, for years uh, at MIT and, and then my graduate work and, and my years at Stanford until his untimely death. And uh, we, we have missed him for a long time. And I have to thank Grumman Aircraft, whose scholarship provided my MIT undergraduate tuition, as well as four summers building Navy jet carrier aircraft. Another set of wonderful experiences. Until you've worked in a defense plant for four summers, starting on a factory floor and ending up in engineering, you don't really understand how the system works. So that was an invaluable experience. Source of broad learning about the nature of work and, and uh, the practice of government contracting. <laughs> OK, and I have to thank Schlumberger. By the way, Schlumberger is where Ali worked before I met him. Uh, IBM and Raymond Wildridge, now TRW, for the three years of fellowships that enabled me to get my doctorate. So we don't, we don't see as much of that corporate uh, generosity as we used to. Maybe they think the government's handling it, but it isn't, unfortunately. And I appreciate very much the, the opportunity uh, to have met students from all over the world, uh, some 90 of them now doctoral students and other students who, who uh, have made major effects on my life. Uh, and, and, to, and they're spreading the word on decision analysis, on freedom and on ethics, which is not too bad. And finally, uh, I wish I could have met Bernoulli, Laplace, and Markov to let them know the influence they've had on my life and should have on others for a very long time. Thank you. Carl. Handshakes for insurance agents. <laughs>
I ran out of the room, had to leap a barrier for the dog, knocked my head, practically unconscious, ran, put water on it, put baking soda on it, and then I looked at my clothes full of holes from this boiling sulfuric acid. I think it's 360 degrees or something that boils in. But luckily, I didn't make the nitroglycerin. <laughs> my house would be missing. OK, well, Ron has covered a lot. And I've got quite a bit here, but it's going to be more like a movie than a, a presentation. Um, and the, some of it will be a little bit redundant, but maybe slightly different. Perspective, uh, I just did this last night. I, I pulled out an old presentation I'd given to the students. I think EES, uh, MSNE 353 is the class I'll be teaching. So I did this on an earlier, I've taught it about three or four times. Um, we used to give seminars. This was the lead slide. And it's just, you know, scanned off of some old presentation. Decision analysis of balancing of the factors that influence the decision. He read that, right? This is the original, you haven't said much about the decision analysis cycle. And this is the phases of, you know, start deterministically, find out what's important, then add probability, and then see if there's any more information you should gather. That's been broadened to examine the whole basis. In the feedback loop, gather information, we now have more of a basis appraisal, basis development. So we've twisted this a little bit. And I remember when we formed strategic decisions group. We had this on the board, Carl and Ron and a few others, trying to figure out how to apply this to strategy and synchronize it with strategy processes. And you know, we cooked up cycles you've seen for strategy, but it all grew out of that. Um, so Ron's thesis was on decision making uh, through dynamic programming in a Markov process uh, setting. Uh, Bellman, who's very famous for dynamic programming, gave Ron a lot of credit for doing this. My own thesis was use dynamic programming. It was about uh, teaching machines and human learning and trying to apply the psychological models that people had, which were Markov process models, uh, to see if you could really teach better with them. Later. They did uh, experiments and found out random teaching was much better than using their models. But they got a lot of money from NSF by building them. Uh, Mutual Admiration Society. I'm afraid we were talking about funding in Ron's <laughs> fellowships. You know, now if you want to get money, you form a Mutual Admiration Society. You go to NSF, and each, each of you tells them this is a good new field to invest in. But, uh, it's a different story, like you say, Ron, for another day. But the corollary of this is dynamic programming and Markov processes are really good preparation for clear thinking. We both did it independ independently. I knew of Ron's work. I certainly used his work. But we both worked independently applying dynamic programming to things. And if you can think through Markov processes in that sophisticated a setting, then you think clearly about probability. And we both did this before we met. <laughs> then we met in the spring of 64. Obviously, uh, went to, um, we hit it off. We both said, why don't people do this? It's so obvious. I remember actually probably saying those words. And the reason I didn't go to MIT with this job offer, partly I felt obligated to Westinghouse, who had supported my graduate work. But also, um, he wasn't going to be there. He was going to be on sabbatical at Stanford. So I went to Westinghouse and hired him. Uh, and while he was doing the GE superheater, I did the first couple decision analysis at Westinghouse. Um, so it probably in the same, same year you were doing your analysis, I was doing mine. And he may, Ron probably was advising me on it. One was a, a brand new TV method that Westinghouse was developing. And there's an interesting vignette here. So I sat down with the, the guy who understood this new kind of TV and said, what's the market, what is the royalty income going to be from this new patented kind of television? And I carefully assessed it. 
and I got a bimodal distribution, which was a good lesson right there. If I had said, give me a 10, 50, 90, and use some standard stuff, I wouldn't have detected it. And it came from the fact that if the FCC made it a standard, everybody would give them royalties. And if they didn't, only a few would give them royalties. But there was an underlying issue. But don't be too quick to assess the probability. Um, and then he wrote the paper that he's read from, Defining the Field. I came back, and by the way, the reason I went to Stanford was Bill Linville. Got my PhD, and then returned to West, and then I returned because again, Bill Linville and Ron were creating this program at, at SRI that was called the Joint Engineering Economic Systems Program. So we did many different things at the beginning. Uh, I remember meeting Doug Engelbart, and he showed me his mouse and all of that. You probably saw that too, right? Him explaining the mouse. Okay, so the DA group established in 66. I led it for 15 years. Uh, and I, th I like the little engine that could story. We thought we could, we thought we could, and we did. Many practitioners did internships with this group or joined it. I'll say a little bit more. Uh, I want to go quickly. At that time, we were associated with the IEEE and the System Science and Cybernetics. I think I was head of the Committee on Decision Making or something. I think Ron may have been the guest author for this issue. And I just want to show you this is 1968, I think it said. Warner North, Tutorial Introduction to Decision Theory, Ron Howard, Foundations of Decision Analysis, uh, some other names in here, but ones you will know. You know, Pratt did something, Tribus did something, Carl did his uh, work, that he, his first decision analysis. When did you do that, Carl? What, what year would that have been? Like 65? 66, so we were starting in 64, and you did your first stuff around 66, so not, not much, and most of what you did originally was completely independent of us, too. So we came together having done our initial work. Um, Fishburne was in here, I was in here. It's a very interesting paper by, uh, isn't Jane's in here? Yeah, Jane's, and that's, it's on the, it's on the, yeah, it's the fundamentals of how to think about assessing probabilities using invariance kinds of thinking. Like a coin, if you don't care which side you label heads and tails, it's got to be 50-50. That's Jane's. Yeah, probably others too, but Jane's extended that. We wrote a publication in 68 that became a bestseller, the best, most er of this program had ever sold of their publication. And then we started giving seminars, the first one being in Switzerland. And were you at the first seminar in Switzerland, you and Warner? I think, I think there was a preliminary seminar that, that Carl and Warner North gave, and then the, more of us came over, and then we did a seminar for the Swiss military. And that started a whole sequence of seminars, uh, probably through the rest of that century. Our sales method was to just be known for giving the seminars and educating business people mostly uh, in decision analysis. And this is kind of a funny one. When Ron went to Harvard in the fall of 71, and we took a walk with Howard Rafe, I came and I gave a talk on some kind of sequential decision making. Um, we were walking around the campus and Rafe said, he didn't like decision, why did you use that name? And Ron says, well, I wanted decision engineering, and I really wish you had used that, but he didn't because he thought it meant manipulation. Uh, and we had this big conversation with Howard Rafa, and he just kept poo-pooing, you know, that, that's just not right. It shouldn't be analysis, you know. Maybe decision is okay. And then we get a copy of his book. <laughs> and we fall off our chairs. <laughs> But that probably unified the East and West Coast, because you know, there was an East Coast decision theory, maybe more statistical decision theory, less engineering. And we were very engineering-oriented. We, 
we think of it as the engineering of decisions. Like you'd build a bridge, you'd engineer a decision. One of the first applications was the Mexican electrical system. And uh, one of the things about this is many attributes. We had to deal with multiple values for a government, so we're not just about writing NPV of profit. Uh, then we worked on the Voyager space project planning. I always like this picture of the different levels of mission outcome from flyby to finally landing and seeing a Martian moose. <laughs> I, I, I'm in love with that moose. I, <laughs> okay, then we worked for uh, ARPA at the time, now DARPA, on automated decision aids. And we were grappling with large decision trees. We also had Warner and Al Miller working for the intelligence community, trying to quickly assess complex probabilities. And remember, Al Miller had 17 different ways to, to think about probabilistic information. And one of them was influence diagrams, which we glommed onto. And you know they're so useful, I don't have to sell them to this crowd, but you can use them for the math, you can use them for explaining to the boss, the English major we were talking about, what's going on. This is the original layout, if you can read any of those labels. It was about Mideast conflicts that are still going on. That's the original influence diagram. Um, Okay, one of the things I wanted to hit on for sure was the notable early applications, Morgan Guarantee. We worked on sources and uses of funds with a guy named Herb Ayers, some of you may know, who was a vice president. I can't resist telling you one story there. We encoded the risk attitude of the two top executives, like the chairman of the board and the chairman of the sources and uses committee. The chairman of the board, about a $15,000 risk tolerance. It's typical. Ralph Leach, who was the chairman of Sources and Uses, I had to change the scale on the paper, and it came out like 15 million. And the president says to Ralph Leach, you're nuts, how can you have that big risk tolerance? He says, you're acting like your mother taught you when you were a kid, you're a rich man, and you don't know it. <laughs> Move that risk tolerance up. Anyway, so that, that was kind of interesting. And we all, if you look at yourself behaviorally, you're acting the way you learned when you were a kid, by and large, taking too much insurance, et cetera. New product development, uh, Mars contamination from Earth, Earth's contaminated by Mars, mine opening, one Carl did that's a disguised in the blue books on uh, very interesting results in that on value of information. That the, the most important thing you'd think would be how much ore is in the mine. That wasn't really important, there was enough. What was important was whether you could get the impurities out of it. Um, Petro Exxon, hurricane seeding was a big one. It's written up, forest fires, synthetic fuels, nuclear reprocessing. At the time that Carter was banning nuclear reprocessing, which had the side effect of actually ban banning the high temperature gas reactor. Uh, I'll talk more about nuclear someday. Okay, then we had the diaspora spin-off of, um, or diaspora, I guess, spin-off to decision focus. So you can see the Warner, Ed Cazalet, Dean Boyd, Dale Nesbitt. Another spin-off formed applied decision analysis, Al Miller, Tom Rice, Bruce Judd at the time. And then through RPA and then quickly we found that SDG it was kind of a funny story there, too, but we found that SDG in about two weeks. We realized we were breaking up with RPA, and boom, we all got to work. Some people got money. Some, I negotiated with RPA, and in, in two weeks we were running, and all the business RPA thought we wouldn't get all came in, so we had no financing problems. Uh, on the R&D front, um, we, we formed a decision Quality, R&D decision quality group, some of the, Boeing was in it. Um, and it was a forum to bring together executives with a common interest. We developed some large scale software, which they, we've inherited in, in R&D decision advisor and, deci uh, and uh, portfolio management navigator. We demonstrated that decision quality could be defined and measurement, measured. Lots of things happened. 
funny thing for this group, we had a users group that met yearly. And the people in that users group said, why are we paying SDG to hold these meetings? We could meet ourselves at our companies. And they rebelled and formed DAG. <laughs> so DAG came out of that group. It was a spin-off of the users group. And the principles of the smart organization were defined. You've seen them, but we've talked about continual learning quite a bit here, that life is about learning. It's, it's not static. Uh, I just want to put that in context very quickly that there's a lot about best practices in the decision quality chain, but there's a second learning loop. This comes from uh, Chris Argerus, which is learning the underlying principles that give you the setting so you can apply everything we talk about. Okay, Ramsey Medalist out of the group. Uh, the only one that's not here is Warner North, and he does a lot of work in the governmental setting. But four Ramsey Medal is pretty good. And people in that group played with various charities, founded the Decision Education Foundation around 2001, I think. And uh, Amy is working with them as a development leader. Carl, of course, is the chairman of it now. Yeah. So, um, and we encourage you all to help contribute either with your time in helping teach kids how to make better decisions, or we could use a little money to keep the organization going. I think this is my last slide. Uh, I've been thinking about, and we have had many conversations about where does the profession stop? You know, the first one is you're the nerd, and you add up numbers, and you know, there's kind of a personalistic view where I sit down as a decision maker, list your outcomes, give me their probabilities, give me their utilities, and I'll multiply and tell you what to do. Um, that's the extreme of that. Then we talked about decision facilitators, and I think facilitation is really important. Uh, productive meetings, and the extreme of that might be Larry Phillips, who's also a Ramsey medalist, who makes decisions in quick meetings, but uses very, little, very light analytics, let's say. Smart guy but a uh, different style. Uh, then decision consultants want to retain, get commitment, you know, get the company committed to outcomes. Uh, decision engineer, I think which is a new role, which is actually engineering companies and their systems to make good decisions consistently, as opposed to the consulting mode that we've earned livings through. And finally, the change agent, that gets all the way down to the roots of the culture and changes the company. So I have a few references if we hand this out later. Um, but it's been a great 50 years, and uh, I'm looking forward to this whole year of celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Jim. So, Terry, I'm going to ask this group for giving us an extra five minutes out of the break, and we would like to hear the other side of the ocean here, or I mean at the, of the country, uh, what happened on that side. Thanks. Uh, I'll talk about the East Coast diaspora. Uh, you saw the West Coast diaspora. I uh, started out at Stanford in uh, 1973. The Army was kind enough to uh, ask me to teach at West Point, and they said, uh, we don't care where you go, what you uh, take, uh, here are the courses we want you to teach. And I was fortunate enough that uh, the person I was going to be working for happened to be a PhD student of Ron's, uh, Brigadier General Al Grum. And he suggested I look at the Stanford program. Uh, I did. I showed up there at a time we had just kicked ROTC off campus. So there were about 30 of us military folks wandering around. They warned us, don't wear your uniforms, let your hair grow long. So it was great. We had no problem with that. Uh, my first uh, DA project was for Jim Matheson's course on DA. Uh, it was an advanced DA project course. And uh, we went out to Moffett Field and did an R&D resource allocation for the folks out there. And that's what got me hooked. Uh, my path was a little bit different than some of the other folks that, uh, that Jim talked about. I still had some Army stuff to do. I went back. I introduced decision analysis at West Point. It's now at all the service academies, at the Air Force Institute of Technology, and it's putting a lot of good decision analysts out there in the field right now. 
Uh, but I had to take a break for a couple of years. Uh, I was uh, commanding a nuclear weapons detachment in Athens, Greece, uh, doing that during the day and writing my thesis for uh, Ed Sondek in the evenings on uh, uh, diagnosing cardiac care patients with Bayesian networks. So uh, big discrimination, uh, nuclear weapons during the day, cardiac care at night. Uh, I came back, I got out of the Army in 1979. Jim probably doesn't remember this, but I called him from Torrejon, Spain, saying, I was I'm getting out of the service, I'm on my way back, uh, would you have me come out for an interview? And he consented, but I had to stop on the way first at a company called Decisions and Designs Incorporated on the East Coast. And uh, never made it out to the West Coast after I stopped there. So here's kind of the legacy. Here's the, the family tree. Basically, DDI was a, uh, a firm that was started in the early 70s. And it differed from uh, the SRI group in, uh, in that it had three different major components. The engineering component that came out of the Stanford group, the business school aspect that came out of Harvard, and the cognitive psychology group, which came out of uh, University of Michigan. Ward Edwards students, Cam Peterson, Larry Phillips, you heard mention. And DDI operated uh, pretty much evenly balanced between those three different disciplines. They did a lot of research, a lot of decision aiding work. I was part of the applied decision analysis group working for one of Ron's students, Dennis Beattie. And uh, I started to put th some names up there so you can see the incest that goes through this as these companies evolve. Ron talked about how uh, the interconnections keep meshing. Well, uh, basically, uh, I was with DDI for a few years. They eventually sold out to a Rhode Island Hospital Trust, and DA eventually died out, and DDI disappeared. But there was a spinoff company, Decisions, uh, Decision Science Consortium. Again, some of the people from the Harvard School, some from the Michigan School, some from the uh, EES department. Uh, we did very, very well for quite a few years, grew to around 40 people, sold to a larger company. The DA business died out. There's a pattern here that, that I've been seeing over the last 50 years. Uh, you get into the big company, they say they're going to absorb your technology, you're going to do the same things. It just doesn't seem to happen. We've seen that in uh, at least three different companies. Uh, when uh, we spun off to ICF, uh, I went out on my own, Dennis went out on his own, and we decided to get together and start a new company called Innovative Decisions Incorporated. And uh, what's the best thing to do? Go look for old Stanford people that we used to work with. And you can see the list of people that are all students of Ron's, that uh, as we grew, we grew very, very slowly, two or three people a year, and we conscientiously went out to seek people who we knew how they made the decisions, we knew they thought the same way we did, and uh, you can see a lot of Ron and Jim's legacy right there. They're with the company right now. And uh, we're up to 45, 50 people. Uh, it's pretty much the same as the DDI model in, in the way that we do applied decision analysis, but a lot of the decision conferencing that Jim uh, mentioned. Uh, decision conferencing is the notion of walk in the room with the problem, walk out with the solution in two or three days. It was started at DDI by Larry Phillips and Cam Peterson. Uh, we carried it on quite a bit. I personally have conducted well over 1,000 of these facilitated decision conferences. And Jim's right. You can't do the same level of modeling in a decision conference that you would do in a long-term applied decision analysis. But we do an awful lot of multi-attribute, uh, some fairly low-level probabilistic modeling, a lot of cost-benefit analysis. And uh, that's the legacy that's followed through through uh, innovative decisions right now. And now they're struggling with the link between DA and the analytics. How is that transition going to happen? That's kind of where we've come to at this point in time. It's getting, uh, over the years, it was very easy to get the government to fund these uh, types of projects. We were mostly in the government sector, unlike uh, SDG. Uh, they were funding a lot of decision-aiding work. Uh, it was very easy. Uh, as a high-end DA boutique, they were willing to pay for high-quality, although higher-cost efforts. These days, that contracting environment has totally changed. Now the name of the game is huge contracts, get the cheapest company they can that just clears threshold. So it makes it much, much tougher for the higher end, the higher quality boutique types of firms to uh, do business in this kind of environment. But that's kind of where we stand. Um, uh, a couple of uh, quick anecdotes so we can get off on the break on time. We think at uh, IDI we have the longest single running decision analytic project uh, of all times. Uh, the Marine Corps budget problem, the program objective memorandum, what they call their POM. It was started back in the 70s by Dennis Beattie and Ken Kusky, who took some of the techniques from Stanford and developed the methodology that the Marines have been using since the early 70s. We're still doing it today. And you know you've gotten somewhere when they kind of name the process for you. So they now call this the Kusky method. Uh, Ken is the one who's been doing it for 30 years. And it's great when they uh, name it for you, and you're the adjective, the Kusky method. But now he's also a noun and a verb. They're going to go out and do a Kusky this week, or we're going to Kusky these particular projects. So you know it's been institutionalized in the organization when that type of thing happens. And uh, the last thing I'm going to mention is the most interesting decision analytic process that I did. 
Uh, it was an effort a few years ago where it was a massive facilitation. I had 120 of the top experts in the intelligence community spending two days to prioritize the future intelligence needs. And we had broken up into four groups, and each group had group wear, and uh, they were going simultaneously. And the first day went terrific. It was a really good session. The second day, we're starting off in the morning, and I personally was facilitating the session where we were trying to prioritize future needs for counterterrorism. And it started out great, then all of a sudden a beeper went off, and another beeper went off, and the whole room full of beepers went off. It was 9-11. And while we were there prioritizing the needs for counterterrorism, the planes hit the World Trade Center, the plane hit the Pentagon. We were just a few miles from the Pentagon. And talk about people uh, in, in a panic mode all of a sudden. Like I said, the top 100 people in the intelligence community uh, were all sitting in a room when this was going on. Uh, needless to say, the decision conference went to hell. We never quite <laughs> got, got finished after that. But uh, I owe a lot to Ron and to Jim. The legacy is there. We're trying to keep it going. One of our biggest challenges now, how do we hand it down to the third generation? We kind of view ourselves as the second generation decision analysts. And it, it's a struggle to pass this on down to the next generation. And uh, I'll end it there, Carl. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so we s heard primarily the Ron Howard branch of decision analysis and its history today. Uh, November 8, which I think is the biggest practice part, okay? So it, it includes a lot of us. On November 8, and pl there are pieces of paper around on your tables, save the date. Uh, we're going to have a gala celebra celebration in San Francisco the day before the INFORMS meeting starts, which starts on that Sunday. Uh, we will start out with an afternoon program. It is co-chaired by Ralph Keeney. And if he were here, Ralph Keeney and myself, if he were here today, we would have had the other branch also explained. So we uh, expect to have both Ron and Howard Rafa there at that time and honor them. Uh, yesterday, for those of you that were here, uh, this is old news, but uh, those that weren't here, uh, the Society of Decision Professionals has uh, said that they will go forward with an award that's called the Rafa Howard Award. Our intention is to be able to give the first one at the cele uh, celebratory dinner that evening and uh, have it actually be given in the presence of Ron uh, and Howard Rafa and be able to have the recipients of that award know what the sources were in building up to that. So we expect that to be a major celebration. Uh, the room size is limited. And uh, the dinner in the evening, I know already of companies, uh, including SDG, that want to buy some tables. But we're, we're going to set it up where it's like a $250 plate dinner. And uh, certain organizations want to sponsor some and, and, and engage in that and invite people there. So get it on your calendar and pass it out, and we will have enough sheets of paper of, of this around that gives that kind of uh, information. The other thing that'll be really interesting, uh, the follow-on informed session, and maybe at another point, Eric, uh, you can say a little bit about that, because Eric chairs the DA Society informs uh, session and we're trying to get a tie-in and expand on some of the things that we'll only touch on during the celebration. Okay, so uh, I think the program will, uh, for the DA Society will have some significant meat. Uh, I get to chair one session, and what I want to do is give five-minute synopsis of people that did these de decision analyses back in the 70s, and I want to know what would they do different today. Okay? So, to me, it's all about how has it changed? What have we learned and what can we do today that we can't do then? But thank you very much, Ron, for being here. Again, I think it makes this event a very special uh, event today. And what's our schedule now in terms of uh, uh, lunchtime and so on? Who's back in charge? We come back in 20 minutes? Okay. <laughs>